The sun has left and forgotten me. It's dark, I cannot Your stories see. don't define you, but how you tell them what will. Hi, I'm your host, Sarah Elkins, Chief Storymaker at Elkins Consulting. And just a quick announcement before we get started. There are still spots left for the No Longer Virtual Summit for Entrepreneurs and Innovators in February. So check out the agenda and the details at elkinsconsulting.com forward slash NLV hyphen home. So it took a couple of missed connections to get to today, but I'm so glad we managed to make this recording happen. And listeners, you are in for such a treat. I've been thinking a lot about resilience and persistence and how incremental comfort makes us less tolerant to discomfort, less tolerant to change and growth. And when you think about the struggles you've experienced, some of the hardest challenges you've overcome may feel small compared to obstacles you know others have overcome. But I just want to remind you that your struggle is relative to your life and your experience. So I think a lot about this idea of being uncomfortable and how it makes us grow. So keep that in mind as you hear Amberly speak today, because you are going to be in for such a treat. Amberly Lago is joining us today, thanks to an introduction by Ben Albert. Amberly, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you so much, Sarah. And I am so grateful that Ben introduced us. He has become a really good friend of mine. Actually, he's going to come. He's so generous um, introducing us, and he's going to come and speak to my mastermind. And I've just never met anyone quite like him. He made a graphic for me that I just posted on my social media. I'm blown away. I'm not good at making graphics. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> I'm blown away, but I was so grateful that he introduced us. And we just started talking before we hit record and we're like, oh, we, oh yeah, we're supposed to be recording a podcast. We better record this. Um, I just instantly connected with you. So thank you so much for having me on. And my intention is to really provide some value for everybody listening to claim their own resilience and thrive, especially through 2023. Yes, absolutely. And we have a lot to be grateful for and a lot to look forward to, I think, in the in the coming years. So Amberly, I always begin these episodes with a question. I am going to ask you to share something about yourself that people might not know about you. Something maybe from your childhood, but definitely something that's not on your bio. Let's see. Probably that my first like big claim to fame was I was a backup <laughs> dancer uh, for MC Hammer in a video. That was my first big music video that I ever danced in. So I was a professional dancer before I was into the fitness industry. And um, I thought, oh my goodness, my dreams have come true. I'm <laughs> dancing the can't touch this on a video. And so, yeah, that was, that's probably oh something a lot gosh. of people don't know. <laughs> that's amazing. I loved MC Hammer back in the day. I still, oh my gosh, my son, our younger son went to Israel this summer and he came back with these pants that were like, almost like parachute pants, like those well, parachute pants. Yes. Oh and my goodness. My husband and I were just laughing. We're like, okay, it's 2022. And our son is wearing MC Hammer pants. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so cool. You know, when that Clubhouse <laughs> app came out, mm -hmm. um, I was on it when it first came out. And one day I was in a room on a panel with MC Hammer. And I was like, no way. Like 30 years <sighs> later, here I Old am connecting circle. with MC Hammer again. That is hilarious. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you for sharing that. And it's really, um, it's a great segue into what we were talking about right before I hit record about um, that idea of reaching kind of a pinnacle and also knowing that you need to take care of yourself in order to, um, continue to, to be resilient, to do what you're doing into the future. So reaching that pinnacle that, that sure, that's a, a destination of sorts, but we have so much more ahead of us. Mm -hmm. So, um, just as a, um, an introduction to you. Tell me what you do without telling me what you do. And 
By that, I'm asking you to share a story about a recent work experience that really demonstrates the why behind your work. Well, you know, I I love that you're bringing this up because I learned from a very young age that, you know, I prided myself and I had this PhD and suck it up, you know, and to me that was grit. I was like successful because of my grit and I mistook, um, health scares for heroic acts. Um, I would push myself and growing up an athlete and a dancer, you know, it was like, you would run on that intake. I grew up in Texas on the track and my coach would say, throw up off the track and then keep running. Cause she could see when you're running so hard, you're about to throw up and you're like, okay, well, I'm getting a medal around my neck. Even if I threw up and it's hurt and I've got a sprained ankle, but I got first place, um, you know, dancing on in point shoes, um, my toes would be bleeding. And it was like, the teacher would be like, the show must go on. And I remember there was one time I was in a car accident. I had broken my leg. They hadn't looked at the x-ray yet. I was actually about to go on stage and try to do a can-can with a broken leg. It was a, a, a fracture and it could have easily become a compound fracture. And so my whole life up until I would say probably maybe about six years, and it's not something that I'm perfect at, but I've had to learn to really listen to my body. And because I ended up going septic, I had a kidney stone that got lodged. It got caused an infection in my kidney. I gave a motivational speech while I was passing a kidney stone. The first time I was, and I've been through some, you know, like a lot of most people, um, challenges, health stuff. This was the first time I was really scared. I was in the hospital and the doctor said, if you would have waited one more day, you would have been dead. And that shook me up. And after that, I vowed to myself to listen to my body, to listen. What is pain telling me? Pain is an indicator. And before we hit record, we were talking about, um, I had said something about, it's not the amount of time invested in something, but it's about energy. I think everything is energy and energy is everything. And so now I look at a situation like, you know, I was saying it's my dream to go to Montana. And I was offered this beautiful opportunity to go do a job in Montana and it was a retreat. And first it was three days. And I'm like, I can do three days teaching 30 people in an intimate atmosphere. I love people. Then it got pushed to know it's actually five days. And then you're going to have to lead the morning workout and then the hike and then the workshops and then the breakout sessions and the talk and the dinner and the everything. And I thought I physically and mentally need to protect myself. I could do it because I got that PhD and suck it up, but that's not something that works for me anymore. I don't think that's what grit is anymore. I lived for so long in that fight or flight. And now I want to live in flow. I want to really take care of myself. And so as hard as it was for me to say, no, I'm, I, I, I'm not going to be able to do that five-day retreat. And I wanted to go to Montana my health is more important. And I had a friend of mine really kind of help me with that too. She told me at one point, she saw how hard I would push and I would just so, you know, my endurance and persistence and, and she could tell I was kind of just driving myself into the ground. She said, Amberly, your impact is only as big and strong as you are healthy. And I was like, Oh, wow. So to me, health comes first. My sobriety comes first. And I think it's really important to know what your priorities are. And it makes saying yes or no to opportunities or situations um, a lot easier and a lot faster. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, two things popped into my head as you were speaking. And one is this whole idea that your, your definition of grit has changed. And um, I've recently been focusing on what success looks like to people. I was a guest on Success, the podcast with Carla Perra, um a few months ago, and I interviewed her. We talked about 
success being um, something that you need to acknowledge as you're working towards something and not making success the destination. Mm -hmm. So we've talked about defining success, but how do you define grit now? Well, I used to define grit as like a lot of us do, especially as entrepreneurs, is the hustle and just work hard, just work harder, just focus more, just post more, just keep pushing. And it was, it really changed one day when my husband looked at me, I had my leg that I've had 34 surgeries on. It was swollen. I had it propped up on the dinner table as we were eating dinner and he could look at me. And as much as I don't like to complain or talk about pain, he could see the pain coming out of my eyes. And he's like, you really need to pace yourself, um, which that's not a lighthearted uh, subject for an entrepreneur. I'm like, I was a little offended. I was like, pace myself. What do you mean? <laughs> what like, does you that mean even to, look like? <laughs> like, what? Do you, I, I was really like a little I feel offended. like I am pacing myself. I'm pacing yes. myself really fast. <laughs> yes. Right. And I really had to learn um, pace doesn't necessarily mean that I have to stop or I have to slow down or I have to rest. Yes, rest comes into play, but it really, I had to look at it as a win-win. So pace, instead of myself going, oh, I've got a PhD and suck it up, that started to shift to, I've got a PhD and taking things by stride and focusing on the long game instead of like, how is this going to be sustainable? How is this, how am I going to find joy for the journey? And what I have really found, because when I was trying to just grit it out before, and I had this PhD in suck it up, which was really meant I was solely relying on myself to do anything. Um, it led to a lot of physical pain, which led to emotional pain, which led to addiction, which led to me feeling really, really alone. And I decided to double down on that. I'm like, well, let me just build up a wall around me so nobody can see my pain or my shame or my self-doubt or my feelings of unworthiness. And then I was left with this medal around my neck, but standing in a podium where no one could see me. I completely built a wall around myself. And it was when one day I was running through the airport and I w- we had gotten held up in TSA. I was with my young, my daughter and we were running. I had my hands, you know, full, all, all the bags uh, that I was carrying. And I ran right up to the gate and I could see the plane pulling away from the terminal. Oh. The door had shut and I dropped all my bags and I just started crying in the middle of the airport. And my daughter looked up at me and she said, wow, mama, I didn't know you knew how to cry. And I realized, wow, this whole story that I had told myself was not only a story that I created myself of grit and being tough and being strong, but it was a story that I had created for my family. And I thought something's got to change. This is not right. I want my kids to be able to let their feelings rise to the surface. And instead of like, dealing with this, really healing it. And so little by little, I started to change. And the one thing that I realized more than ever that made a huge impact was grit plus community equals resilience. When you are asking for help, not just asking for help, but when you're connecting with community, when you're sharing your vulnerability, when you're actually talking about what's going on, you realize so many other people are going through the exact same thing as you, you know, Mm -hmm. I didn't want people to know I was in pain. I just was like, well, I'm just going to get grittier. I'm going to get stronger. I'm going to just work harder. And it worked until it didn't. And what I've learned uh, is grit is so much about yes, endurance, but not even so much about enduring pain, but I talked about being in flow And I had to kind of come up with, well, what does flow look like for me? And I came up with kind of an acronym to, as a check-in for myself. And I hope it helps someone who's listening, anybody who's listening today is flow stands for frequency, love, optimism, and wonder. And if I can approach things 
like adversity or challenge instead of the fight or flight, but in flow. And when I say frequency, I'm not talking about how many times you go to the gym or how many times you're posting on social media, but the frequency, the energy, how are you connected with your higher power? Um, what are you doing to raise your frequency? How are you, you know, when we have a higher frequency, we feel lighter, we feel serenity, we feel more joyous. So and frequency so as in sound and yeah. energy. Ah. Yes. And you know, light. And light. light. The higher and, it is, the better it is. And I can don't like when I met you and we started talking, I immediately, my frequency changed. It was just lighter because you carry that high frequency and I can feel it even though we're talking through zoom, you know, and I think the people that you connect with um, really is a great way to raise your frequency or not the people that you immediately feel heavier with, you feel negative, you know, and it is a thing. And just the other day, my husband was like, why does the dog shake every time I come near? And I said, oh, she doesn't like your frequency. And he goes, frequency, what's that? And I'm like, yeah, you have kind of a heavy, scary frequency right now. <laughs> and he thought it was crazy. <laughs> Nobody wants to be around that. It's terrifying. Yeah, but people feel it. Animals feel it. And gratitude has been one of the quickest and easiest ways for me to shift my frequency and feel better. Um, as well as connection and forgiveness and acts of service and meditation and prayer. Um, and then the love part of the flow is I had to learn to love myself because I hated myself after my accident. I mean, I really, and that's a four letter word. I hated the way I looked, my legs all deformed. I hated that it gave me so much pain. I hated that I couldn't do the things that I used to do. I hated my life. I hated everything. And I had a doctor that helped me shift that. He looked at my leg like it was a masterpiece, like it was a piece of art. And I thought, wow. You're still if, walking. And I can walk. <laughs> and I started with gratitude going, maybe if I'm willing to just give myself a chance to love my leg and myself again, and I'm not saying it was easy, but I was willing. And every day I just tried a little more. And when you can love yourself, you can love others. And when you love what you can do, there's just not a day that goes by that you don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And when you put love and care into something, it makes all the difference. I think that's one of the reasons, Sarah, I think that's one of the reasons you have such a successful podcast and you have such a successful events is because you put so much love into it. And then that leads me to the, Oh, optimism. And I'm not always a positive person. And I've had to learn to really talk to myself instead of listen to myself, because I have that inner critic that can be really mean. Mm -hmm. um, so I've learned to talk to myself and the minute I hear myself or someone else saying something negative, I learned to switch it up either with affirmations, um, uh, and, and just own it and authentically be myself. And when I say that, it's just like at the gym this morning. So I wear boots to work out in, and people are like, that girl's crazy. And in fact, my nickname at the gym is boots. And because my ankles fused and the CRPS, if I have anything tight on my foot, it'll give me a flare up. And so a girl walked up to, to me today. And she's like, yeah, why do you wear those boots? I'm like, Oh, it's because they allow me to work out and be in less pain. It's awesome. I said, I mean, I wouldn't try it unless you really need them. But, but when I completely owned it, she was like, oh, well, you know what? They probably are good for squats, you know, but at first she came over to me with like kind of a negativity and because I was so positive about it, it shifted her frequency. You know what I mean? And then the last part is wonder, like if we can look at things with wonder and we can ask the right questions, because there was a time when I was asking myself all the wrong questions, I was completely falling into victimhood. I was asking myself, why me? Uh, what am I going to get? If. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and even awful. what ifs I was like, what, if, instead of what's the worst that what can happen? What's the best that can happen instead of why me what's next. 
And then, you know, I remember laying in the hospital bed we had a hospital bed downstairs after my motorcycle accident. And, and, um, I was laying there going, what am I going to do? How am I going to get through this? How am I going to get through this pain? And I heard my daughter, she was two years old at the time. And all she said was mama. And I was like, this is why I'm going to get through it. I'm going to be an example of resilience for her. And when we ask ourselves why with wonder and curiosity, it activates our human spirit and it's powerful beyond measure. Mm -hmm. And so that has really kind of changed things for me instead of going, I've just got to grit this out and I've got a PhD and suck it up. I'm like, no, how can I connect with others? How can I help others get through challenges? And that turns pain to purpose for me. Mm -hmm. I'd like to come back to this idea of resilience, because when I gave a, a keynote on the topic of storytelling to build resilience, one of the things I said in the very first part of the speech was, resilience doesn't mean by yourself. Yeah. And that was, that was my first sentence to my mother was by self, by self, I can do it by self. Yeah. And I'm petite five foot two. And throughout my young adult life, I would take it as a, a total challenge. I would spite people for thinking I couldn't do certain things because I was little. And I remember thinking the uh, thinking of myself as being resilient and persistent and kind of hardcore because I do this stuff all by myself because I could, you know, by self, the, those were, that's my phrase. And it wasn't until, um, I think I was probably in my late thirties and my older son was 12 years old. I'd gone to Costco, got this huge bag of dog food and I pretty easily put it in the cart, but getting it out of the cart and into the car was hard because my I'm short. I was strong enough, but it was awkward. And I remember struggling with it. And somebody, a, a strong young man, just walked right by me. He could see me struggling with this bag. And I realized it's because my energy was, don't even ask. I've got this. And yet I was insulted that he didn't stop to help. And it wasn't until I turned to the mirror and said, well, why wouldn't he stop to help? Well, because I'm giving this attitude. I'm putting out this energy. Don't even think about offering. So I put it in the car and I put the cart back because that's what conscious people do. They put the cart back, just, you know, throwing that in there on my little soapbox. <laughs> but I remember getting home and I walked down the little stairs from the driveway down to our back door. And I saw my 12 year old and I said, Jacob, will you help me unload the groceries, please? And he walked out to the car and I remember just turning in time to see him pick up that bag like it didn't weigh anything and put it over his shoulder and walk down the stairs. And I thought, why am I doing this by myself? Mm -hmm. We have, we all have different talents to give and resilience mm -hmm. doesn't mean I can do this by myself. I can get through this. I can suck it up by myself. Resilience means what resources do I have to help me get through this? Mm -hmm. And you're I'm resource. all about the resources. Yeah. Well, am, your resource am... was your, your daughter saying, mom, mama. I mean, that is, that's a resource for you. Mm -hmm. That energy of, of choosing to do this for her, but that still doesn't mean you're by yourself. Yeah. And I mean, that's the thing I was just explaining to a client this, this morning, she's somebody that's in my mastermind and she really wants to build her brand. And I'm like, you don't build it by yourself. I was like, you need to collaborate. And I got, I kind of got off the phone and I told my husband, I was like, I don't understand. It's, it's harder for some people to communicate or have those skills where they do connect and man, connection is where the magic is. And that's the reason I started my mastermind because when I first started with this business, um, you know, when I went from my fitness business to doing speaking and I wrote my book and doing this kind of coaching, 
I was doing it by myself. Again, I had never written a book and all, I was like, I, and now looking back, I'm like, I wish that I had some guidance or a group of women that were there to cheer me on or offer support or help. And so that's why I created my mastermind. And I was trying to explain to her um, just with her podcast, I was like, your podcast is great. You're great, but you want to build your brand. You're doing every episode by yourself. I said, invite special guests on your show. I was like, it's the best thing that I've done for my business. Ben talks about this too, about, you know, that's how you, that that's the best thing I've done for my business is my podcast. Cause I get to meet amazing people like you, you know, and then who knows, we're going to be friends for life. I'm going to be going to Montana, calling you up when I'm in Montana. <laughs> mm-hmm, you sure are. We're going to hike together. Yes. Oh, I miss hiking so much. That's what I miss so much about living here in Texas. There's no mountains. And that was my favorite thing to do in California was just go on the trails. Mm -hmm. Well, you have something to look forward to when you get here. I'll send you some pictures after we finish recording. Okay. Okay. It is beautiful here. So when I, I, I just want to come full circle back to the beginning of our conversation about the idea that being full of grit and being resilient and having perseverance, first of all, doesn't mean by yourself. And second of all, doesn't mean moving head head first into a brick wall over and over and over again to get things done. And before we hit record, you talked about your choice to take some time this week to prepare for early 2023, to prepare for your keynotes that you're doing next year. And the fact that it isn't just sitting, you're you're taking time, but as an entrepreneur, we're not just sitting on the couch and reading a book in front of the fireplace. We're not sitting and having wine with our friends every afternoon because as an entrepreneur, we're constantly working. Our, Our brains are constantly in it. And as my work is the same as yours in that it's very cerebral. So it's not a physically exhausting thing necessarily, although for when we're speaking and we're hosting workshops, it is also physically exhausting. Mm -hmm. But we talked earlier about the emotional exhaustion that comes with it, the intellectual exhaustion that comes with the work that we do. And the way you are choosing to spread out that work through the months and through the year and not to be so headstrong to take on every opportunity that drops into your lap, um, but to, to be intentional about it. And I I would like to dive into this just a little bit because I think people don't know that that is the case and we don't share that with people enough that we need to take that time. We need to understand our emotional and, and intellectual exhaustion, our social exhaustion, and we need to make sure people understand that so that they can then, like your daughter, have permission to demonstrate that vulnerability and the choice to, to cry or to take time away? Yeah. Well, I, that's such a great question. And I think that I, I'm, I have not been so good about this in the past. It's something that I still work on and I'm not perfect at it. And this is actually the first year. So I've had my podcast um, for three years and this is the first time ever that I have taken two taken two weeks off from the podcast. Now I have like three months worth of episodes reported already, but I intentionally stopped for two weeks. That means I'm not posting about a new show or creating assets for a new show because I know January, I have four keynotes coming up. Well, three that are in person, one that's virtual, and I'm going to be traveling all over the country And so I thought I'm going to take this time um, to give my body a break, to give my mind a break, to give my soul a break, to spend time with family, you know, but uh, we, it's, we, it's kind of comical (laughs) if you're an entrepreneur, because Mm -hmm. to me, time off isn't, you know, sitting, eating bonbons, you know, binging on Netflix. It's actually, I will sit in, in living room with my husband and, and, in all transparency, my husband and I just went to therapy and he's like, you know, 
she sits, he goes, I've just gotten used to her. She sits to, to watch TV and she's on her phone. She's on her phone the whole time. And I'm like, but honey, I can't just sit and watch TV because I don't enjoy that. I can watch TV and be listening and I'm responding to comments or DMs on Instagram. That's just more relaxing to me um, than just binging on TV. I I don't know. Um, But this time off for me has been me planning my big in-person event in March but I haven't been doing as many interviews and I haven't been coaching clients. And I I said no to in-person events and other things and big meetings and stuff like that. But the reason I decided this year, I need to get really intentional about taking this time off is not just because I have a, a lot of big things coming up next month, but it's because I was starting to feel a little burnout. I was starting to lose some of that excitement and joy for the journey. And I had to take a step back and go, what am I doing differently? What, what, why am I losing that spark for what I do? And it was because I was doing too much. I was taught when I first wrote my book, I had an amazing publicist, but she was like, you say yes to everything. Yes to every opportunity. So any blog post, any um, podcast episode, any speaking event, whether it was paid, free, whatever, you say yes. And I was saying yes to everything. And there came a time where I was like, I can't say yes to everything. And I need to get intentional to what brings me joy, uh, what's going to move the needle on my business, what's going to make you know, meaningful connections for me. Um, and, and what is it? I think it's really important to pause and yes, reflect, um, on the past year, but also get intentional about how you want your next year. What do you want that to look like? And, you know, I, I remember years and years ago, I used to always have these big resolutions and these big goals. And now, I usually choose one word and I let that be my driving force, you know, and I remember in 2020, ironically, my word was resilience. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and that seemed to be the buzzword, Um, you know, and then last year um, my word was, I think it was joy this year. My word is flow because I want to be in flow state. I want to just not be in the fight or flight. I just want to be flow. And, you know, um, and so I think it's important to, to take time to pause so you can ask yourself what's really important. What does your heart, what's your heart calling you to do? Um, because it's easy as an entrepreneur to, and especially when we're looking at social media and everything looks so easy and it just looks like, oh, wow, they've got a best selling book or, they're on another talk show or wow, they're doing that speaking event. You don't see what's going on behind the scenes of, you know, you see speakers get on stage and you don't see behind the scenes. Like, I mean, I've got my little note cards here on my desk where I, and people probably think I'm crazy at the gym because I'm on the step mill going over my new keynote in my head. It takes a lot of effort, effort and thought and intention And I think it's really important to take some time and not be all about that hustle culture, but to take care of our mental and our physical health. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I know that I can't provide the kind of service and, and generosity to my podcast guests or to my clients or um, to my family, if I'm not paying attention to that potential for burnout. And as an entrepreneur, when you think about something that felt like real success to you, uh, and I asked this question because um, after my conversation with Carla Para, I realized as I was hiking on the mountain, we were watching our neighbor's dog for a week and I was taking her out for a hike. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon. And I thought, oh, I have to get the dog out while it's sunny because the sun sets so early here this time of year and I've got to get out. And so I closed up my computer. It's like almost two o'clock in the afternoon grab the dog, grab some treats and my bottle of water, bundle up because it was like 12 degrees outside and went barreling up the mountain, just, you know, fast, getting the dog a a good 
a good 20 yards ahead of me with the ball because I use a chuck it, you know, the, the tool that you can throw the ball really far. And I'm throwing it on as close to the the path as I can, because otherwise we're going to lose it in the snow. And, you know, I'm thinking and my brain is going. And all of a sudden it dawned on me as I hit one of the, the minor summits before getting to the top of the mountain. It dawned on me that it was two in the afternoon. And I took the dog for a walk. I closed up everything. I knew I could come back to it later, but my time was mine. Mm -hmm. It was my choice what I did. It was a two hour hike on the mountain. I got back just before it started to get dark. Two hours on this mountain, breathing that crisp air. It was so cold when I left, but by the time I got to the top, I was unzipped. My hat was in my pocket because I was, my core had warmed up so much from this hike. And I thought, this is what success looks like for my entrepreneurial adventure. Mm -hmm. So when was one moment where you thought, okay, this is, this is what success looks like to me. Well, I love that story. You're such a great storyteller. Um, you. you are, I could just, I was right there with you. Um, yeah. You know, it's interesting because I, I, to me, I, I've, fortunately been able to do a lot of exciting things like, you know, been on the today show and done a Ted talk and been on stages with people like Mel Robbins and Ed Milet and Jay Shetty, like some of the, you know, it's dream come true really. But those really aren't things that I think of as my success. I, I think that for me, success is being able to do the things that you love with the people that love that with the people that you love when you want to do them, that's for it's freedom. Mm -hmm. But I just had a moment. Um, I was telling you before we hit record that I had a moment where it kind of sunk in and I felt some success, I guess you could say. Um, so we just moved into our house six weeks ago and we had, you know, been unpacking bags and had just been rushing around nonstop and trying to get my off at my home office set up and all these things. And it was getting late and we have these individual hammocks hanging from outside on the porch and they're so fun. And my 14 uh, year old said, mom, mom, just come sit outside in the hammock with me. And we were both sitting in the hammock everything stopped. It was really quiet. It was just such a beautiful night. And we've got mm. these twinkle lights over the hammock. And I looked back at the house and I looked at my daughter and I loved being in this hammock with her. And, you know, there was a time where I had $2.9 million worth of medical expenses and we had a lien on our house. And I've been able to provide for my family and buy this house for them and see my daughter so happy being in Texas. And I think seeing the freedom that she has, because where we were in LA, the homelessness was getting really bad and we had been hit by a car. She had seen me get mugged. I mean, that's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. And so to see her have this freedom to run around and we've got like an acre of land. And she sets up these people jumps. She's a horseback rider and she's jumping a horse and she's doing the jumps herself. And so to me, success was that moment where it was spending time with my daughter and seeing what I was able to provide for my family and the freedom and the happiness that we had together as a family. Mm. That's perfect. That's a perfect way to wrap this up. Ah, oh, I was sitting there with you in that hammock with the twinkle lights. I cried. I, I sat in that hammock and just this overwhelming feeling of gratitude came over me. I, and I just, I cried and I thought, wow, you know, you're, yes, I've worked hard, but your hard work puts you where your blessings can find you. And I, wasn't paying attention to like, um, I got to hit these number of downloads or I've got to get this many followers or I've got to get on that stage. I just kept focusing on how can I keep being of service and helping other people. 
And I was chasing purpose and not money. And things started to, I want anyone who's struggling or thinking, oh, you know, I I don't know if this will ever happen for me. It can, if I can rebuild my life, you can rebuild yours too. Mm -hmm. And, and you're right. It has to be around purpose. It can't be a selfish, um, not just about, not about income. I mean, it can't, it can't be just about income uh, because then you may get there still, but it's going to be hollow. It's not going to feel as satisfying, but even more importantly, it can't be about you. (laughs) I mean, that's been my experience as well. As soon as I make an impact on others where people feel better about their jobs when I'm doing strengths finder work, or when people feel more confident to step out of their comfort zone, when I'm doing storytelling coaching or people who want to speak at and tell a story at an interview, it's those interactions that, that drive success as far as I'm concerned. And mm-hmm. you just shared exactly that purpose by sharing that story about sitting with your daughter outside of the house. Thank you. I, I'm so glad we connected. Thank you so much for having me on your show. It has been so awesome talking to you. And I know we're going to have an awesome time hiking sometime. Yes, we will. And thank you so much for taking the time on the, the, the week that you are experiencing whatever downtime looks like for you, which obviously doesn't look the same for everybody. Um, but Amberly, this has been such a treat and I so appreciate your time and energy in sharing that with me today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for listening to your stories. Don't define you how you tell them. Well, now it's your turn listeners out there. What's your story of resilience and who was involved? Smile. What's the use of crying? You'll find that life is still worthwhile if you just smile